All right, thank you, Phoebe. <clears throat> All right, good morning, Solano. <laughs> Happy Labor Day. And uh, excited to hang out with the uh, college students next week. Who are the college students? Just shout out. Can I hear like a woot woot or? I was a little weak, but I hear you. You're out there. Um, actually, Labor Day is kind of a special weekend uh, for the Nunez clan uh, because we actually moved into our house uh, this weekend in uh, El Cerrito. We signed a one-year lease. And actually, we moved into the RV on September 1st, 2020, and moved into our house September 1st, 2021. So kind of a crazy coincidence on the same day. Uh, and so our year of our RV trip is, feels officially kind of over. There's some things on the back end we got to do, like my RV is getting fixed up right now. Um, and I was thinking about it, and we traveled 25,000 miles in a year in this RV, so uh, what's the width of the U.S.? Is it like a 3,000, it's 4,000 miles? I, gotta, I, I should research this before I get up here. Uh, so just think how many times, you know, five or six times going back and forth across the country. We did not go back and forth across the country five or six times, by the way, just once. Um, but I, in, that three, in those 25,000 miles, I had three insurance claims. And one of them was December 20th, 2020, and then I went the whole year with only one insurance claim, and two weeks ago, I had two insurance claims, two weeks ago, and the first one, I have a picture of it, here it is, I hit a rock wall, I was turning left and ran into this big rock wall at the entrance of an RV park, it's like a 51% my fault, 49% the RV park's fault for putting a rock wall right at the entrance where you have to make a sharp left to get into it. Maybe 51 there, there, 41, 51, I don't know. You decide. Um, but two weeks ago, I was at an RV park, and I hit a fire hydrant. <laughs> and um, I was pretty upset about that because I couldn't see it. It's too low, and when I'm in the truck, I couldn't see it. And it's not, notice it's not protected by any uh, uh, posts, metal posts. So whose fault is that? And, and so then I just was doing a three-point turn. I was going, I wasn't doing anything crazy. I was going slow. It's in a weird spot. It's kind of in the middle of all the RV uh, um, uh, parking slots. And there it is. And I didn't even see it. And boom, I hit it. And just a little bump knocked off the top. And all of a sudden this water starts spewing in front of my, I'm like, oh, no. Um, and so, you know, the reason I'm sharing this is, first of all, just a little therapy for me, before you guys, I, and, and also because, you know, there's just, I'm going to be sharing with you guys some anecdotes from my RV trip, okay, just get used to that, let's just accept that for a little while, I'm not going to overdo it, I promise, but I do want to share a little bit, because here's the deal about our RV trip, is that we knew there would be obstacles when we decided to live in an RV for a year, but there was no plan B, we were going to go for it, and we knew it meant we were going to, stuff was going to happen. I didn't know what. I didn't know I'd be hitting the fire hydrant. But stuff was going to happen. And we had to keep, we had to figure it out. We had to keep going. We had to trust God to provide. Now, my sermon today is on the part of the Great Commission where we are talking about where Jesus commands us to get going and make disciples. So our RV trip was kind of this one-year adventure. <clears throat> but God calls us to follow him on this mission, right? And there's no plan B. Jesus has given his followers one strategy and one strategy only. That we, his followers, would go into the nations and we would make disciples. And our core four... I guess we're doing everything in twos today, so you're going to see everything twice, apparently. So here is the uh, slide again, and it's a ministry to the world. We want to be a missional church. Last week, Andrew talked about that we need to be a worshiping church. So we see that in the Great Commission. We see that the disciples worship Jesus. He is with them always. But he has a mission for them to accomplish. That's what we're going to talk about today. 
And so the idea is that we want to rebuild our vision as a church for this mission. <clears throat> We've taken some hits. We've hit our rock walls. A fire hydrant out of nowhere popped up and we hit it. All right. <clears throat> COVID. That sounds like COVID to me. Just all of a sudden, it's upon us. There it is. We've had our obstacles, but God is calling us to keep going because there is no plan B. There is only one great commission. And so we need to rebuild our vision for this aspect of the great commission. The call to go into the world, to have a ministry to the world. And so in order to rebuild that, I want to try to do three things today. I want us to see it. I want us to just look at the Great Commission and let, it, let, let us marinate in it. We need to own it. We need to own it in the face of obstacles and pushback. And lastly, we're going to need to figure it out. <clears throat> we're going to need to figure out how to fulfill this mission. By the way, can I get someone to bring me a, a, a thing of water? So, so we need to see it. And I've broken up the Great Commission for this sermon into four parts. All right, You could break up the Great Commission into many different ways. I've done four parts. There's a goal. There's the labor. There's the dream. And there's the twist. Right? So there's a goal. There's a labor we have to do. There's a dream. And then there's a twist. <clears throat> if you were to ask... What is the goal of, our, of a church? What is it that we are to do? If you ask organizations that are really successful, what makes them successful? What they're supposed to tell you at least is that they do one thing really, really well. They have one thing that is their mission to accomplish and that is their focus and that is what they obsess about and that is what their goal is. If you were to ask, what is the church's one goal, the target that we are called to hit as, good, as well as we can, the answer would be that our goal is to make disciples. Thank you, Nicole. <clears throat> is there a lid for this? Oh, it's right there. Can I get that lid, Paul? Thank you. All right, where was I? Okay. He says, go, all authority in heaven has been, on earth has been given to me. Go, therefore, and make disciples. That is the only verb in the, in the Greek, in the Great Commission, is to make disciples. And so that is our target. That is what we're trying to do. If we need to measure everything we do as a church by that target, that goal of how well are we making disciples, we're not trying to say, how many people are we getting in the room? That's not our goal. How big is our budget? How many programs are we doing? How many people are showing up to that programs? The question is, are we helping people become true followers of Jesus? Where they are believing in the gospel, they are picking up their cross, they are dying to themselves, and they are being obedient to Jesus and bearing fruit. That is our goal. We are to be asking that question. That has to radically shape everything we do. Are we making disciples? But in order to do that, there needs to be a labor. That's a great goal. But if we're going to actually make disciples, then we need to be doing two things constantly. There is two areas that we as a church must be laboring in to, with as much strength and creativity and vigor as we possibly can. And so Jesus says there need, we need to be doing two things. Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and teaching them to obey. The two things that we have to do as a church is we have to be a baptizing church and we have to be a teaching to obey church. We are called to, and I, I like to keep those together, teaching to obey. It's not just teaching doctrine. It's not just filling up knowledge, but we're to teach to obey. So if we're going to make disciples, we have to make sure the rubber is hitting the road in our 
belief in Jesus, that we're actually obeying him. We're actually doing what he calls us to do. But actually, uh, next week, Pastor Andrew will hit on that more. The teaching to obey all that Jesus has commanded. That's next week. This week, today, I want to focus on the baptizing part. The go into all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. And what baptizing means, if we think about what that means, it means that we are bringing people into the kingdom. That is what God wants his churches to be focusing on and doing and figuring out is bringing people into the kingdom, baptizing them. That's the idea that there is a radical life change, that they are going from being in the world, people are going from being far from God to now identifying their allegiance as being for God, but not just God generically, We're not just calling people to believe in God, some God. We're not just calling people to have faith. As long as you have faith, whatever that faith is, that's great. We're calling, Jesus calls us to baptize people in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. That God. The Father, the the triune God. The one true God. That is who We want to introduce people to. We want to baptize them in that name. Right? The Father, the one who loves us, created us. The Son, the one who paid for our sins, rose from the grave, is coming again. And the Spirit, who actually indwells us and empowers us to believe and to obey Jesus. That's the name. And so this means that we have to do the work of evangelism. The Great Commission, when Jesus says, I'm sending you out to make disciples, he's saying, we all as his followers need to do the work of evangelism. Now that word evangelism, I think, has become a bad word in our culture. Both because of within Christianity and some of our own bad track record, bad track record and from the culture itself. That word evangelism is kind of a bad word. So let me talk about that word for a second. That word actually comes from the Greek word evangelizo. Evangelizo, which if you were to look at your English, uh, if you read your English, it's translated preach the gospel. Preach the gospel is the word evangelizo in the Greek. It's one word, it's a verb. The word for gospel is the word evangelion. It's a noun. My point in saying that is that in the Greek, the word gospel is both a noun and a verb. It is both something that is true and something that we do. So in other words, the idea is that the, the idea of gospel must be a noun and a verb in our lives. It's something we believe in, and it's something we do. We gospelize. If you don't like the word evangelize, then how about the word gospelize? Because that's more literally what's happening in the Greek. So we do ourselves a disservice by having two different words, but we are called to do both. So we need to be a baptizing church. We need to be the kind of church that is going into the world and helping bringing people into the kingdom. And so that is the labor that God calls us to, teaching and baptizing. But there's also a vision. There's a dream. The idea behind a vision is this is that part of what you do with your life that gets you excited. And you know know that question, what gets you up in the morning? You know, that, that people who achieve greatness in this life, they have a clear answer to that question. And, and that's, that's a vision, right? What, why are you doing what you're doing? You may know your goal. You may know what you have to do to achieve that goal. But why are you doing that goal? Why is that goal so exciting? And so the most eye-popping part of the Great Commission, in my opinion, what's supposed to make us go, wow, 
is all nations. That's the vision. That's the dream. That this gospel is supposed to change the world. This is the climax of the entire Bible being fulfilled. This is the from Abrahamic promise that his the Abraham's offspring would be a blessing to all nations is now being fulfilled by the coming of Jesus Christ but it is going to be achieved by us going to the nations that's the dream If you were to ask Jesus what gets you up in the morning Jesus what gets you up so early in the morning and actually keeps you up so late at night I think he'd answer it this way He said he would answer it by saying I'm going to the nations. I'm going to bring the gospel to the world. Watch this in, uh, love this in Isaiah. This is God talking about a servant, his servant. He says, it is too light a thing for you that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. That's vision language. Hey, this is too small a task for you. This is too small a goal. This is, this is a preferred future that isn't that exciting compared to what you could do. This is vision language. This is dream language. It's too small a thing to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the end of the earth. So that's the vision. That's the dream. That's what should excite us as followers of Jesus, that this is a world-changing good news that's for all people, that's to go to the ends of the globe. But there's a twist. The twist is that Jesus fulfills this dream, this vision, through us. When we talk about this servant idea of the servant that's too small a thing for the servant to redeem Israel, that his salvation would reach at the ends of the earth, there's no mention that the servant is going to come and then leave. And so there's this twist at the end of the Great Commission where Jesus says, I am going to be with you always to the ends of the age. And you kind of imagine the disciples standing there being like, wait a minute. What do you mean you're going to be with us? You mean, wait, you're supposed to fulfill the Great Commission, Jesus. You're, you're the one. Wait, you're saying, wait, are you saying us? We, but you fill it. You fulfill, no, we do. Are we doing it? And you can imagine this confusion. In fact, it probably got real for the disciples in Acts when Jesus literally ascended into heaven. And they're like, yeah, wow, he's really leaving. He's really going. We're to go do this. And in fact, we're going to see the disciples are going to struggle with that. Right? Remember Peter? There's some Gentiles like literally across the street. And God's like, hey, you need to go reach them. And Peter's like, no. No way. I'm not going to do that. So they struggled with this idea. And so the idea here is that if that's the vision is all nations and the goal is to make disciples, then As followers of Jesus, we need to have a mentality. We need to have an attitude that uh, we must get going and bring this gospel into the nations. Go and make disciples. And now, some people who know their Greek have pointed out that that word go is a participle. In the English, it looks like a command, but it's not a command in the Greek, so it's really while you are going. But I don't think that's the case. Because actually, a participle that follow that is preceding an imperative has imperative force, which means in the Greek it should be some kind of there is a go force to it. But more importantly, he's telling a group of 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 this Jewish men to go to all nations. So, do you think they were naturally going to go into all the nations to share the gospel? You got to imagine that the Jewish culture, they were some of the most um, xenophobic, exclusive, um, uh, kind of condescending to other cultures that you could imagine was the Jewish culture. 
They were, I mean, I mentioned it. Peter didn't even want to step into a room of other Gentiles. So you better believe that Jesus had a, a command to them to say, you need to get going. So that's the Paul Nunez translation. I'm still making it a participle. Get going and make disciples of all nations. So that needs to be our DNA, is that we get going and make disciples. And that has to be our mentality. I think that um, a good illustration of, I, I think the way Christians can maybe view ourselves or maybe, or, or maybe a picture of, of, of Christians fulfilling the Great Commission is, is actually from the Lord of the Rings. Right? Last week, last, last time I preached, I talked about Harry Potter, now Lord of the Rings. Next time will be Chronicles of Narnia. But actually, I think, I, I don't know if Tolkien meant to do this, but I think the hobbits are actually supposed to be a picture of Christians. Both good and bad. They, are, they, they illustrate the way Christians are so well. They're, first of all, they're small people. They're little, right? They're called halflings. Right? So they're just like little, small people. No one really pays attention to them. And they don't really pay attention to other people, actually. They live in the Shire, and they have their little parties, and they drink their beer, and they have their supper, and they're happy with that. They just want to live in their nice little Shire, and they don't want anyone to mess around with them, and they don't want to mess around with anybody. But it turns out that they are uniquely qualified to overcome the evils of the world around them. They have this happy little um, utopic Shire but actually the world around them is in chaos because of Sauron and his evil forces. And it's actually the, hob- the hobbits that are, uniquely, that are uniquely gifted to overcome that evil because of their smallness, actually. It's actually Bilbo, right, because he's so small that he can go in and help to uh, be a thief with the dragon, and it's Frodo, because he's, he's a humble hobbit, that he's not going to be as tempted by the power of the ring. And so Gandalf says, you have to be the one to go on this, this mission. And of course, they resist, and Bilbo has the famous line where he says, adventures make you late for supper. And sometimes I think Christians have, we have that attitude, but it's actually the fact that we are small that makes us uniquely qualified because the gospel has made us small. Hasn't it? Hasn't the gospel humbled us? Hasn't the gospel shown us that we are sinners? That we're the worst sinners in the room? Hasn't it taught us our need for grace? That we actually need to be saved every day? And that we see see how far we fall short every day? You know what that does to us? It humbles us. It makes us small. And Jesus says, now you're ready to be my witnesses. Now you're ready to be a witness to what the cross is. And the glory and bigness of God and his salvation because you are now small. You are now a humble people. Paul says it more strongly. You are a people of no account. You are the foolish and despised of the world. You are the babes of the world. But God has chosen you to display his glory and his salvation to the world and make fools of the world is the way that that Paul talks about it. But through our humility. That's why we're uniquely called and gifted. Why we have to go. Because we're like those hobbits. (laughs) It's, it's, It's our smallness that, be, that because of grace, we can be witnesses to the gospel. So now that we see it, we see the goal, we see the labor, the vision of nations, and the twist that he sends us. Now what we have to do is we have to own it. We have to own it because there's going to be cultural pushback. And this is important to understand because anytime you go on a mission, you have to have a credible agency that sends you, right? In other words, you have to have the credentials to accomplish that mission, right? You have to um, have the right to go on that mission. So you need a sending agency. And so Jesus says, 
in order to have the right to go into all nations, I, I am giving you the authority because of my death and my resurrection over death. I've, I've conquered death. I've conquered sin for the world. And so now you need to bring this gospel to all nations. I authorize you to do that. And that authorizing is important because at every culture and every time, the gospel is going to come up against resistance. Some cultures or every culture at some point is going to be contradictory to the message of Jesus Christ and the mission of Jesus Christ. And so Jesus says, where you hit that tension, you need to push through that. You need to be even willing to break through that. And that's going to be very hard to do. Because culture is a very intense authority in our lives. It is, something that, it is something that we use as a lens to figure out what life's about. Listen to um, Karen uh, Swallow Pryor, who is a professor at Liberty University, now at Southeastern. She's a professor at a seminary. And Joshua, uh, Josh Chatra, they wrote a book called Cultural Engagement for Beginners. Basically, they wrote a book saying, hey, Christians, we're not very good at engaging culture. So here's a book to help us out with that. And listen to what they said. Our current culture, or sorry, our culture communicates and orients how we think, live, and decide. We don't just read culture, we read through the lens of culture. We read through the lens culture provides. Without normally providing explicit thesis statements, culture most powerfully communicates by providing pre reflective frameworks for meaning and values. What this is saying is that culture kind of works as an information processor to make sense out of life, but it works in the background. It doesn't, culture just doesn't come out and say, you need to believe A, B, and C, and you need to reject A, B, and C. It just kind of influences us. So, for example, the Bill of Rights, you know, is this sense of here's your rights um, as people against the government, right? But that begins to seep into um, our, our kind of DNA as a culture to where, you know, we have a strong sense of individualism. Our sense of individual rights is, is now this kind of sacred reality. And so that's part of the lens that we're, we're understanding the world through. And so these cultural values go deep, and it's not easy to go against them. So when Jesus calls Christians to pursue his mission, he's actually calling us to go against sometimes our own cultural values. In other words, we need to be a counterculture in some ways. And that's going to be very, very hard to do. Um, Because culture is what gives us our sense of what's acceptable, what's right, what we should and should not be doing. So for example... You know, the idea that we need to love our neighbor, that is something our culture embraces. So if Christians, we can preach that all day and we're all going to be really comfortable with that. Yeah, we need to go do that. But then Christianity also teaches a sexual ethic of only sex and marriage. And suddenly we're like, ooh, our culture has a problem with that. But how about this one? Christianity calls us to go and baptize people. In the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. It calls us to share the gospel and bring people into the kingdom. You know what our culture says about that? That's proselytizing. That's pushing your faith on people. Remember our individualistic culture that's impressing on us? That's violating that. You can't tell me what to believe. And so Christians, we have a problem. How do we fulfill Jesus' mission when we're pressing against our own cultural values? And so, uh, you know, Pryor and Chata, they bring up this idea of, of liturgies. And what they mean by the, the word liturgy is these formal communal practices that shape us. These communal practices that form us, right? So like our, our holiday traditions, our democratic processes, the ways, that we, um, the ways that we engage in entertainment, these are actually liturgies that teach us how, what's, how to live and what's right and what's acceptable. And they essentially make us into worshipers. 
And so the idea there is some of these liturgies are fine, but we have to make sure that as Christians we are engaging in our own liturgies. We have to make sure that we are doing our own communal practices so that we are being identified and living out Christ's culture, the one that he calls us to be, so that we, not, we don't become um, captive to culture. So if we're going to be if we're going to be faithful to fulfill the mission, we can't be captive to the culture. There are things about it we can appreciate because we're aligned. Christian values are aligned with it. There are things that the the culture is going to be neutral on. But as I mentioned, there's things that they're going to be contradictory on, and we can't become captive to that. And so, but because we're a part of that culture, it's going to deeply affect us. So we have to have our own counterculture through our own liturgy. So that's why Sunday sermon, Sunday, Sunday worship is a liturgy where we come and we remember that we are making melodies in our hearts to God, so we're singing to him. We remember that he's the king of our life, and so we sit quietly and listen to his word so that we can obey. But then we do things like we go to home group. That's another liturgy where we talk about how the rubber is hitting the road in our lives. Where our effort to be on mission with Jesus is actually, um, where, where we're actually struggling with that or where, how we're seeing it worked out in the world. And so we need those liturgies to help form us so that we are able to impact the culture instead of being captive to the culture. So, we need to own it. We need to kind of own the authority that Jesus gives us, that we have to be a baptizing church. We have to go and make disciples. We have to have have a going mentality. But the other obstacle that we have to face is our own bad track record in this area. Um, And our own bad track record, especially in the area of the social imperative of the gospel. The imperative to love our neighbor, we have not done a good job about that. Especially in the area of social justice. Especially in the area of racial justice. And so because of that, we've done a, I think we've done a good job as kind of white evangelical churches or American evangelical churches. We've done a good job being about going and, and preaching the gospel. We've done a bad job of hearing the voices of the, of the oppressed right next door. We've been a lot like that, those priests and Levites in the parable of the Good Samaritan, where someone was on the street robbed of violence, and we just tried to ignore it. Now, I know here at Solano, you guys have been having a lot of great conversations about that, and, and I've been on a journey in that area as well, trying to repent of that. Um, but we need to remember that we're called to do both. We're called to preach good news and to do good deeds. And listen to, um, so Carl Ellis, I read this book a few years ago. Carl Ellis is an African-American professor at Reformed Theological Seminary. He wrote a book called Free at Last, and he talks about the gospel and the African-American experience. And he talks about how it is important to fight oppression. That is good. We must fight oppression. But he has an important caveat. He says, independence from oppression is a valid goal, but to attempt independence from God is utterly futile. True freedom is being home with my Lord and under the freedom function of God's lordship. What he's saying is, as much as we need to be free from oppression and fight for that, the answer isn't to be free from God. And, and, and there was a temptation there because the Christianity of America was what was used to oppress people. And, he, and, and, and Carl Ellis, helpfully, he calls it white Christianity-ism. He says the Christianity of America is tainted. It's more of a Christianity-ism. But he's trying to call uh, the African-American community back to the idea, but we still need to believe in the gospel. That is where we find true freedom. True freedom because of the freedom function of his lordship. And what he means by that is the idea that the lordship of God and of Jesus Christ in the world is a reality. 
He opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. Those who want to live their life apart from God will reap the consequences of that. But those who accept God's love and rule in their life and they submit to God will receive power and grace from God in this life. So so that is a reality. And he goes on to say that it's, it's like the idea of gravity. We can go, we can try to resist gravity and try to say it doesn't exist. I want freedom from gravity. Forget gravity. And we can do everything we want to try to deny it. And then we, we stand on a roof to, to prove our denial of gravity. We step off. We're going to fall every time. But if we embrace the laws of gravity and the mechanics of gravity and the mechanics of physics, eventually what can we do? Well, then we build wings, and we build an engine, and pretty soon we're flying. And so his point to say is that Jesus' lordship is actually the way to true freedom. Jesus said, you will know the truth, and the truth will make you fly. He might as well have said that. He said the truth will set you free. Because now we're living under the lordship, the way we were meant to live, and so uh, what Carl Ellis, here's how he, he puts a, an exclamation on that. He says, how can African-American consciousness be defined? What should we as people recognize as our standards, our values? Only by seeing ourselves as God sees us will we be able to avoid false self-destructive values. Our values must come from the word of the one true God. So here you have a man speaking to African-American culture. And, and, and speaking to them directly and saying, even though there's been this horrible oppression that we must fight against, yet we must still believe the gospel. We must still know what God says is true of us. And we must still live that out. And so what I take from that from uh, Professor Ellis is the gospel must be preached. Faith comes from hearing and hearing from the word of Christ. We must continue to preach the gospel. And so, yes, if we just preach the gospel and don't do good deeds, if we just preach the gospel and don't care about those crying out in oppression, then yes, we're clanging symbols. And I think that has been American Christianity, American evangelicalism for a long time. But if we do good but don't preach the gospel then maybe we aren't clanging symbols we're just noiseless symbols we're just silent symbols so here's a symbol right here right now if i'm not a drummer if i were to try to play this i don't have a a thing but if i tried to play this you you guys would all say please stop that's an annoying noise But you know what? You know what I promise you? We all want someone to play that cymbal who knows how to play. In fact, I just talked to Miguel. We're looking for a drummer. (laughs) You know why? Because this cymbal is meant to make a joyful noise. Not to sit there silently. Yes, it can be banged in a way that is horrible sounding. But it's meant to make a joyful noise. And so Christians, followers of Christ, Solano Church, God calls us to continue to repent so that we continue to pursue doing good to our neighbors, but we must continue to preach the gospel. And let's remember that Jesus said, I send you as sheep among wolves. Meaning, those of you who get who I am, truly, you're my sheep, but you're going out when there's wolves. And, you know, sometimes we look at that and say, oh, that means people are going to attack us. But I think actually what it means is that there are people who are doing what we're doing in a horrible way. There are people who are tarnishing and corrupting the message of the gospel because their goal isn't to glorify God. It's some other horrible motive. And so we have to remember that there are wolves that are devouring people. But we must continue to be the sheep that Jesus has sent and not just stop altogether bringing the good news because of the wolves around them. So the last thing, my last point here, 
is we need to figure it out. We need to figure it out. This was just my way of saying, you guys, I understand this is hard. I understand trying to reach people, people with the gospel. There's no easy way to do that. But let me give you some encouragement from a passage that I've taken a lot of encouragement from um, that has helped me. This is Paul in, in Colossians chapter 4. He says, continue steadfastly in prayer, being watchful with thanksgiving. At the same time, pray also for us that God may open to us a door for the word to declare the mystery of Christ on account of which I am in prison, that I may make it clear which is how I ought to speak. Do you hear how specific Paul was in how he wanted to be used to share the gospel, that he was going to declare it clearly? But watch when he addresses the Colossians. Watch how he changes his tone and addresses them. He says, walk in wisdom towards outsiders, making the best use of the time. Let your speech always be gracious, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how you ought to answer each person. So notice how he broadens and generalizes for the Colossians. I, Paul, need to declare the gospel clearly as I ought to do. I'm a preacher. But Colossians, here's the deal. You need to be gracious, seasoned with salt. In other words, he's saying, I don't know what it looks like for all of you, but I know this, you need to be nice and you need to have some spice. Christians, we're good at being nice, but don't be bland. Don't be bland. But we gotta figure out what that looks like for each of us. We're all different. We have different friends. We have different personalities. I've had to learn that. This has been a hard journey for me because I came to Christ. Some of you a few weeks ago heard my testimony because one guy called me, met with me, shared the gospel. In one conversation, my life was changed. I thought everybody came to Christ that way. And I continued to do that for years, trying to just have this conversation where I helped them convert in a conversation. And guess what? It wasn't working. People didn't like that. I had to learn. I had to say, okay, what does it mean to be gracious, seasoned with salt? And so you know what I, I had to start telling myself just to become like a normal person? I had to say, you know what, Paul, your goal isn't to share the gospel right now. You know what your goal is? Just love this person. Just enjoy them. That's what I needed to be gracious and salty. Does that make sense? I was a little too salty is my problem. <sighs> I needed to be gracious, seasoned with salt. So for me, what that looked like was I just had to learn to enjoy people around me and doors began to open. And I promise you, I've had many awesome conversations. Well, that doesn't mean I just play it cool all the time. Like I remember my neighbor, I was really enjoying him. We laugh a lot together, but I wasn't having spiritual conversations with him. But there was an Easter service coming up. He's kind of a hermit, so I rarely saw him. You know, and so I had to go, I literally saw him in the driveway. I ran up to him before he went in his car, and I'm kind of huffing and puffing. I was like, hey, uh, I'm out of shape. Hey, uh, uh, we got an Easter service, man. You want to come? <laughs> kind of awkward. But I had to go for it. And you know what he said? He said, yeah, hey, thanks. Um, by the way, what's this Christianity thing all about? Sat there, talked to him about the gospel for 20 minutes. And... When I left, my, my, when I left that, uh, that house, him and I had a great, took him out to coffee, we had a great conversation about the gospel. Gracious, seasoned with salt. So we have to figure it out. We have to figure it out individually. We have to figure it out as a church. We have to get creative. We have to say how, Paul says, I pray for open doors for the gospel. What are the open doors that we as a church can walk through? You know, we're going to do an outreach in uh, October. You know what we're going to do? We're going to go meet our neighbors here in El Cerrito. I want you guys to come out to this. So I just mentioned that we need to figure it out individually, but we got to figure it out corporately. Did you know we have a corporate witness? As much as many of you have a witness in your own spheres of influence, you know we have the ability to have a corporate witness as a church? So we're going to go and meet our neighbors and let them know we're here because we snuck in and then the pandemic hit. And so we want to say hi. 
We will introduce ourselves. And maybe have like coffee and donuts the week later and bless them. But we're going to be figuring this out. What does it look like for us as a church to have a witness? We each need to figure that out. What does it mean to be gracious, seasoned with salt in our spheres of influence? But how, how do we do that as a church? And so, Salona, I just want to close by reminding us today that the death and resurrection of Christ means there's no plan B to the Great Commission because there doesn't need to be. He is risen. He is with us. And he says, you preach the gospel in season and out of season. You preach the gospel when you're going to see a ton of fruit. And you preach the gospel when people don't really want to hear it. We have to figure that out. And so the work of going to make disciples is an invitation to bring Christ's victory on behalf of all people to the world. Let's join him in that work. Let's realize we're uniquely qualified to do that. And so let's walk in the authority he gives us to go into all nations and cultures and make disciples. We need to have a vision and a dream as a church to bring people into the kingdom. Wouldn't you love to see that happen? I want to see that happen. Go, get going, Jesus says. Let's cherish our liturgies together like Sunday service and home groups. These aren't just things that we do because we want, we want to fill seats and we want to feel good about ourselves. We want to be formed into Christ. We want to do mission together as John was giving you guys a vision for that. We want to help unleash your own gifts, your own personalities, help you learn what it means to be gracious, seasoned with salt. And you're going to do that by talking to each other. So we need our liturgies, we need our home groups, our gospel academies, Sundays. Let's be gracious and courageous to see our mistakes as a church. The tradition we've inherited as evangelicals has some skeletons in the closet. Let's get those skeletons out. Let's call them for what they are. But let's continue to press on with good news and good deeds. And lastly... Let's have an attitude of going for it together. Jesus Christ is with us. We cannot fail. But we do need to figure it out. Let me pray. So Holy Spirit, would you come with your wisdom from above? You've called us to go into all nations. And as good as that sounds, as exciting as that sounds, there is a gritty reality that that is a very difficult mission. It is actually impossible. And Lord, we don't know what we're doing. We are, are babies looking for spiritual milk. We are people who are um, the weak and small and despised of the world. But Lord, you have chosen us in order to make your message known to the wise and powerful of the world. So Lord, would you... Give us the grace and favor and power to do that. Give us the grace to live out the grace that you've given us. Lord, that you have taught us to be humble. You have taught us to be grateful worshipers because you have saved us when we didn't deserve it. When we were the worst sinner in the room, you called us and every day we see the gap between our good deeds and your calling, and you call us beloved children, and you call us covered. And now we get to share that good news to others. Would you empower us to do that? Give us that vision, that eye-popping vision to go and make disciples of all nations. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.